I am Dr. Sandeep Singh, working as senior resource person at academic at National Translation Mission. I am pleased to have an opportunity to introduce a great personality, Dr. Rana Naya. He has more than 35 years experience in teaching at higher education level. In 1990, he joined Punjab University Chandigarh where he became professor and head of the Department of English and Cultural Studies. He has also served as visiting professor at Peter Balls Institute of Advanced Studies at University of British Columbia. He is a translator of poetry and short fiction from Punjabi to English. He has more than 40 volumes of poetry and translation works to his credit. Among the prominent Punjabi authors, his translators are included such literary giants as Gurdayal Singh, Amrita Pritham, Raghavir Danda, Mohan Pandari, and Biya Balwant, etc. He has been a Charles Wallace Trust awardee. In 2007, he won Seth Academy Golden Jubilee Prize for his English translation of Punjabi devotional poetry of Sant Baba Thirida. Now I invite Professor Rana Nair to deliver a lecture on topic translation theory and practice. Now I am over to you, Professor. Uh, good afternoon, dear participants. Uh, let's get on with our task on hand because we uh, time is very short. So I don't think we can afford to waste too much of it in common curtsies. Mm -hmm. uh, let me give you an idea of what we are going to talk about over the next hour or so. Dr. Tariq Khan, when he was introducing me, he mentioned something very important and I think I'll stay with it. Uh, yes, I have been a practicing translator for almost over 30 years now. And therefore, I, and I've done a bit of theory as well. I'm not really going to uh, talk much of theory, but I think my focus today will be on pragmatics of translation. Now, let me explain as to what I mean by pragmatics of translation. I think there are, in course of translation, there are several issues that come up. And as practicing translators, we are always searching for answers. So I think we could move on to the next slide. We are always searching for answers. And uh, we are trying to find what is the way in which we can get around certain issues or challenges that come up. So my focus will be on bit of theory, but much of it will be on how theory can possibly help us understand certain issues, especially issues which help us in dealing with the nitty gritty of translation, as I like to put it. <clears throat> Before I get into, um, get into the discussion, I think we all understand what translation is all about. I want to offer one little qualification. I'm not really going to talk about machine translation, nor am I going to talk about, let's say, computer translation. I'm not even concerned here much with what you call translation, which is done by legal experts or translation, which is done very often for commercial purposes. My focus is specifically and exclusively on what we call literary translation. I think the speaker before me, because I had a chance to overhear some part of his discussion, was also talking about literary translation, and that happens to be my domain as well. In that context, the first point that I would like to make is something that you all understand. And I think, let me also say at this juncture, much of what I'm going to say today probably is already known to you. These are the issues that you have been dealing with at some point or the other. So there is nothing new that I'm going to present to you. Perhaps my way of putting it across to you would be slightly different, but that's all that I claim by way of originality, if there is any in what I'm going to say. We all understand what translation is. It is a very complicated process. 
It is a complicated process for the simple reason because it involves two languages. You know, dealing with one language, we all understand is difficult enough. And when you have to do deal with two languages at the same time, I think the process becomes extremely complicated. All practicing translators know we use certain terms for it. The language from which we translate is called source language. For purposes of abbreviation, we use SL. SL is source language. That is the language from which we translate. And target language is the language into which we translate. So in other words, the point I'm trying to make is when we are dealing with two languages, we are dealing with SL and TL. And we are trying to establish some kind of relationship between two languages, even if they happen to be very dissimilar, almost disparate, even though it may seem on the face of it that there is no similarity between the two, still we have to make an effort to bring them together. In other words, if I have to simplify it for you, I would say, you know, translator's job is difficult precisely for the reason because sometimes he has to make two enemies sit together and enter into a dialogue. You know, it's not very difficult to make two friends sit down and prompt them to enter into a dialogue. But you do understand if two people are sworn enemies and they have their polar opposites, it's extremely difficult for us to create a space where dialogue can take place. So translation to my mind is a kind of dialogue between two dissimilar, two very different worlds, so to say, not just words, but two different worlds, so to say, because we all understand, you know, language is not only language. Each language is located in some kind of a culture. So the moment you mention a word, it doesn't just refer to a meaning, it evokes some kind of cultural resonance. That is why translator become translation, sorry, becomes an extremely complicated task, extremely problematic endeavor, because we are trying to set up connections between source culture and target culture, not just source language and target language. Next. Now, there are three ways in which I think we can approach this problem. You could call it problem of definition, which is exactly the way in which it has been phrased here. I've written three definitions of translation, but we are not going to define translation here or we are not only we are not going to look at three different definitions of translation. Instead, we will focus our attention on three methodologies or three ways of approaching translation. In the beginning, when I start talking about it, it might seem to you that these are three different, distinct ways of looking at translation. But by the time we conclude our discussion, you will come to a realization that these are three different ways but these three different ways are equally important if we have to think about translation, if we have to talk about translation. The first is linguistic approach. This is a kind of approach that has been promoted, obviously, by the linguists. Linguists are concerned about the intricacies of language. 
translators are also concerned about the intricacies of language. But what does linguistic approach indicate? Linguistic approach indicates, you know, sometimes when we talk about linguistic approach to translation, it also creates some kind of a mistaken notion in our minds that you can do translation only if you are a linguist. And if you're not a trained linguist, you may not be able to undertake this enterprise. I think I would like to knock down that misconception right in the beginning. You do need understanding of linguistics and a very fine understanding of linguistics if you have to evaluate translation. But I think if you, if you just want to be a translator, then it's not understanding of linguistics so much, but I think it's, under, it's some kind of language sensitivity that you need. With that, I go into this linguistic approach. A number of linguists have looked into this issue, how some kind of, they focus on an idea of equivalence. Now, what is this equivalence? As I pointed out earlier, the translation is some kind of transaction between source language and target language or source culture and target culture. But at the same time, I pointed out to you that each language constitutes a world unto itself, an autotelic world, an autonomous world. Sometimes you may have this feeling that you're trying to set up a dialogue, as I pointed out to you earlier, between two enemies and not necessarily between two friends. Now, but at the same time, I think we always wrestle with this problem of equivalence. Equivalence is not a very simple notion. You know, equivalence, the idea of equivalence comes to us from mathematics, where A plus B square is equal to A square plus B square plus 2AB. I hope I am right about the equation because I did my algebra, I think, way back in class 10, and it's been more than 50 years now. So I may have forgotten these mathematical notations or equations. So the idea of equivalence is essentially a very mathematical formula or a mathematical category. But let us remember in literature, a different kind of mathematics works. Equivalence can be sought it can be sought to be established, but it is not always achievable. I will tell you how and why. I will give you a small example. I will try to explain to you how to make equivalence a problematic issue. We need to think about it. We need to ponder over the problematic of equivalence. Kaise? I will use Hindi. Main ek Bharatiya hoon. Very simple sentence. All of us are Indians. So when I claim Main ek Bharatiya hoon, I think regardless of which language you operate in, you'll be able to relate to it. Ab main aapko kehta hoon, कि इस वाक्य को अंग्रेजी में तर्जुमा कर दीजिए इसका। Translate this into English. All of you will turn around and say, I'm sure. I think this is something which you can give to a class six student and he will do it. I am an Indian. अब ये तो हो गई correct translation. अब सवाल यहां उठता है कि ये करेक्ट ट्रांसलेशन जो हमने की है क्या ये एक तरह की 
इक्वेबलेंस भी सेटअप करती है नाउ वी गेट इन टू लिंग्विस्टिक निटिग्रिटी एट द लेवल ऑफ सीमेंटिक आप सब जानते हैं सीमेंटिक क्या है मीनिंग देर इज इक्वेबलेंस मैं एक भारतीय हूं आई एम एन इंडियन परफेक्ट सीमेंटिक इक्वेबलेंस मीनिंग में कोई चेंज नहीं है आप देख पा रहे हैं कि वन मीन्स दी अदर ओनली द लिंग्विस्टिक मार्कर्स आर डिफरेंट लेकिन अगर मैं एक एक यूनिट को उठाऊं मैं एक भारतीय हूं तो इक्वेबलेंस का फॉर्मूला लगाऊं तो शायद इस मुझे अंग्रेजी में ये नहीं कहना चाहिए आई एम एन इंडियन मुझे ये कहना चाहिए आई एन इंडियन एम वो तो बाद में आया है लेकिन अगर मैं ये कहता हूं आई एन इंडियन एम तो क्या अंग्रेजी के मास्टर या अंग्रेजी के प्रोफेसर मुझे बख्शेंगे या आपको बख्शेंगे बिल्कुल नहीं बख्शेंगे बहुत लताड़ेंगे वो कहेंगे जनाब आप अंग्रेजी के बेसिक्स नहीं जानते हैं कैसे सेंटेंस कंस्ट्रक्ट किया जाता है ये नहीं जानते हैं कहां पर वर्ब लगता है कहां पर सब्जेक्ट आता है ये नहीं जानते हैं आप क्या कर रहे हैं द पॉइंट आई एम ट्राइंग टू मेक इज इफ यू इंसिस्ट ऑन मैथमेटिकल इक्वेबलेंस you will run into serious difficulties when it comes to translation so therefore mathematical equivalence is out sl should be equal to tl but remember sl is never equal to tl sl is more than tl sl is less than tl sl has a very very प्रॉब्लमैटिक रिलेशनशिप विथ टीयर ये याद रखने वाली बात है क्योंकि यहां होता क्या है बिकॉज ईच लैंग्वेज फंक्शन डिफरेंटली सो कई बार कुछ शब्द जो हैं उनको हम एक फॉर्मूला के तहत उस यूनिट में रखते हैं सो ग्रामेटिकल इक्वेबलेंस आ जाती है बट दैट इज नॉट इनफ सीमेंटिक आ जाती है दैट इज नॉट इनफ बिकॉज जो लेक्सिकल मार्कर्स हैं दे हैव टू बी अरेंज लिटल डिफरेंटली सो वट आई एम सेंग इज इक्वेबलेंस होते हुए भी इक्वेबलेंस नहीं होती है और यही ट्रांसलेशन का रहस्य है अगर आप मुझसे पूछें कि इक्वेबलेंस है मैं कहूंगा कुछ हद तक है लेकिन कुछ हद तक नहीं है दैट इज वाई we are constantly we have this tendency to compare a translated work with the original i'm not saying whether we should do it i'm not saying it's wrong to do it yes it is inevitable everyone does it because when you translation at one point is an autonomous text at another it is a text affiliated to the original so ye jo डिलमा है ट्रांसलेशन का मुझे लगता है ये इक्वेबलेंस के प्रिंसिपल से निकलता है नेक्स्ट हेर आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट सम ऑफ द थ्योरिस्ट कैटफोर्ड हैज हैज बीन एक्नॉलेज एज वन ऑफ द फॉरमोस्ट लिंग्विस्ट हु इज डन सेमिनल वर्क इन द एरिया ऑफ ट्रांसलेशन ही टॉक्स अबाउट टू काइंड ऑफ इक्वेबलेंस जिसको वो कहता है formal equivalence and textual equivalence formal ko hum literal sense mein form mein formal sense mein nahi lete hain something which is officious it's not that formal here means connected with form he makes this distinction because in terms of form there will be variations and even if there are variations textual equivalence is more or less possible 
मेरा जो पहले का एग्जाम्पल था उसी पे वापस जाइए और जो कैचफोर्ड जनाब कहने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं वो शायद आप उसी के थ्रू जान सकते हैं नेक्स्ट हेयर आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट द वे इन विच एनदर फेमस लिंग्विस्ट यूजीन नायडा हैज अंडरस्टूड दिस होल आइडिया ऑफ इक्वेबलेंस he makes distinction he uses different terms he makes distinction between formal equivalence which means much the same thing that catford had in mind and dynamic equivalence i think this principle of dynamic equivalence needs to be understood very very carefully by all of us especially those who are interested in translation in the mechanics of translation in the science of translation or even in the art of translation what is this dynamic equivalence you understand one particular sentence in hindi or punjabi or kannada can be translated in 10 different ways i'm talking of literary translation here i'm talking of let's say a poem written in kannada or marathi i think one of the examples can be the examples that was given by the speaker who preceded me he was talking about it how he's tried to play variations on the existing poem i'm talking precisely of that process one sentence multiple ways of translating one text multiple translations what does it make it clear to us there are translations and translations of a particular text or can be of a particular text bible is one it has been translated hundreds of times i'm not talking of different languages i'm talking of different versions of translation that speaks of dynamic equivalence why do we need to do it because each time we are trying to figure out how we can improve upon the existing translation that is dynamic equivalence it's a in evolving process there's nothing static about it if the text was written in 14th century and was translated in 17th century no reason why it cannot be done again in 21st in a different idiom in a different register in a different way or a different through a different approach so one can approach an already translated text this is a question which might be there in so many people's minds can we translate a text which is already translated my answer to that would be yes if you can go one better if you can improve upon it if you find faults with it if you find there are flaws in it and you want to go one better please by all means take it up and do it give us an improved version we'll be none the worse for it will be very happy and will congratulate you next next approach or methodology first was linguistics where the focus is on equivalence and equivalence i suggested to you how it has been interpreted by different linguists in different ways that's not important important thing is we should understand that it's not a very clinical idea it's not a very mathematical idea equivalence has to be there but it's not always there it's problematic next we come to philological approach now what is this philological approach i could have very well used another expression hermeneutic approach because here i'm trying to draw your attention what are philologists concerned with philologists are concerned not only with meaning 
philologists are concerned with the history of words as well. Therefore, the point I'm trying to make is that's the reason why I've not really used the word hermeneutics because it would have narrowed it down to meaning or interpretation. But I would prefer to use the word philology because as a translator, I believe we should not only know the meanings, but we should also know the history of words. Now, why is this necessary? Imagine that you are शेक्सपियर के किसी नाटक का अनुवाद कर रहे हैं तमिल लैंग्वेज में और आप ये सब जानते हैं कि शब्दों के मायने बदलते रहते हैं शब्दों का चुनाव बड़े सोच समझ के करना है हम ये तो सब जानते हैं लेकिन समय समय पर क्या परिवर्तन आते हैं शब्दों के मायनों में इस बात को भी गहराई से समझना एक ट्रांसलेटर के लिए बहुत आवश्यक है मैं ऑलमोस्ट कहने की कोशिश कर रहा हूं ट्रांसलेटर हैज टू बी सम काइंड ऑफ अ फिलोलॉजिस्ट ही हैज टू बी इंटरेस्टेड इन मीनिंग इन हाउ मीनिंग्स आर क्रिएटेड हाउ वर्ड्स आर इंटरप्रेटेड एंड ही आल्सो हैज टू बी इंटरेस्टेड in the archives of meaning he must be able to dig deep into the deep structure of language and excavate different meanings so that he can play around with them main shakespeare ki baat keh raha tha main bhatak gaya thoda sa so kuch shabd hain unke jinke maayne ab badal chuke hain aur agar aap ye nahi jante hain तो शायद हो सकता है आप ट्रांसलेट करते हुए यू माइट एंड अप वर आई वुड लाइक टू कॉल मिस इंटरप्रेटिंग शेक्सपियर एंड वॉट सम थ्योरिस्ट वुड कॉल मिस ट्रांसलेटिंग शेक्सपियर ट्रांसलेशन आर मिस ट्रांसलेशन ऑल्सो देर इज नो जेंडर क्वेश्चन इन वर्ल्ड हेयर बिकॉज द वर्ड मिस इज हाइफनेटेड आई होप यू अंडरस्टैंड M I S, not M I double S. That's not what is intended here. अब जहाँ तक meaning का संबंध है, एक छोटी सी बात आपसे कहना चाहूँगा कि हर भाषा ये आप जानते भी हैं, समझते भी हैं, मेरे कहने की आवश्यकता भी नहीं है. Every language has a layered structure. अक्सर जब लोग मुझसे पूछते हैं कि भाषा का क्या स्वरूप होता है तो मैं उन्हें एक छोटा सा जवाब देता हूं एक एनालॉजी देता हूं और दैट्स एग्जैक्टली द काइंड ऑफ एनालॉजी आई एम गोइंग टू शेयर विद यू एंड दैट एनालॉजी इज आई से इफ यू वांट टू थिंक अबाउट लैंग्वेज एंड अंडरस्टैंड द कंप्लेक्सिटी ऑफ लैंग्वेज थिंक ऑफ डिफरेंट लेयर्स ऑफ अर्थ अर्थ के नीचे इवन विद लिटिल नॉलेज ऑफ जियोग्राफी वी अंडरस्टैंड it has different sedimented layers isi tarah se bhasha ki layers hoti there is literal meaning jisko kuch log referential meaning bhi keh dete dictionary mein ek shabd ke ek maayne hote lekin sahitya mein ek shabd ke kai maayne hote hain because we invest words with very special meanings that's exactly what is called creativity because we don't only deal with referential function of language when we are writing a piece of literature we also deal with emotive function they say i a richards ne kaha tha emotive function what is emotive function jahan pe emotions involve hote hain aur emotions kaise best articulate or express ho sakte hain उसके लिए आपको भाषा की सेकंड लेयर में जाना पड़ता है जिसे आप कॉनोटेटिव लेयर कहेंगे सो डिनोटेशन कॉनोटेशन तीसरी लेयर कौन सी है भाषा की तीसरी लेयर कल्चरल लेयर है कल्चरल मीनिंग्स वेरी आई डोंट वांट टू गेट इनटू दैट क्वेश्चन बट let me give you one simple example 
that will demonstrate what I'm saying here. Because otherwise, you know, it just becomes a statement and it may not go down well with most of you. I remember once I translated Gurdyal Singh Ji and there was a reference to a particular tree which is found in our region. I'm talking of cultural significance. And that tree is called Jand tree. Jand da peed, Punjabi Amastu. When I translated that particular section, you know, I didn't want to spend too much of time decoding the cultural layer. So I said, how does it matter, you know, I can lop off Jand and just retain tree. I was a novice then. I didn't understand the complexities of translation. And I didn't even understand that you need to retain cultural flavor, cultural resonance, cultural specificity. I didn't have access to all those ideas. So I knocked off Jand, retained tree. That translation went to Gurdyal Singh Ji. He was obviously offended. He didn't like it. He looked at it and he sent back three page long explanation to me. And that explanation began with this. Rana, I'm, I'm surprised that you don't understand the cultural significance of Jand. And then he went on to explain the cultural significance at great length. For me, it was an education of sorts. For me, it was a form of cultural education. If on one hand I say translator has to be a philologist, he has to be language sensitive. On the other, I also say that he is involved in a process through which he's constantly educating himself about his own culture. We often take it for granted. We often take it for granted. That is a question. We do know a little, but we don't know it enough. But a translator, later I discovered, and then I actually noted down in my diary, and I said, no departure from this ever, Rana Nayya, if you want to take up translation in a more serious way. So cultural layer is the most significant layer which we sometimes ignore. Before I go into that, let me come to this whole idea of what they say, connotation. At some point I said, one text, many translations. One sentence, many sentences in translation, in the same language. Yehi idea apply karta hai connotation ko. Mai aapko choti si baat kehna chata hon. Let's say mai nahi kehna chata. Aap college mein bethe hain. College wale chahate hain ki aap staff room mein lunch na khaen. Principal Saiba ne ye decision liya hai ki aaj se staff room mein bed ke koi lunch nahi khaega lunch ke liye wo canteen mein jayen. So what does what she wants to convey that to the staff. She has many options before her. Kaise next pe ja sakte hain ji. We can go to the next slide. How? She can simply say, please don't eat in the staff room. See, this is the staff convey ho rahi hai, aur badi politeness se convey ho rahi hai. Jisko hum ek formal sa expression kai sakte hai. If she wants to be a little more formal and a little more contrived, let's say, कुछ लोग ज्यादा स्टाइलाइज्ड होते हैं यू नो भाषा के प्रति भी हमारा जो रिश्ता है बहुत ही कॉम्प्लिकेटेड है भाषा से हम क्या समझते हैं उसको कैसे प्रयोग में लाते हैं हमारा इडियोलेक्ट क्या है कहां तक वो इडियोलेक्ट सोशल सोशल 
लेफ्ट में कन्वर्ट होता है ऑल दीज प्रॉब्लम आर प्रॉब्लम विच वी नीड टू वरी अबाउट एज ट्रांसलेटर्स वी जस्ट कान टेक दम फॉर ग्रांटेड हम ये नहीं कह सकते हैं कि जी मैं तो भाषा इसी तरह से प्रयोग में लाता हूं एक छोटी सी कहानी सुनाऊंगा फिर अपनी बात आगे बढ़ाऊंगा लेट मी फर्स्ट स्टे विद दिस एनालॉजी दिस सेंटेंस दूसरा तरीका क्या है यू आर नॉट एक्सपेक्टेड टू कंज्यूम फूड इन दिस एस्टेब्लिशमेंट अब भारी भरकम वर्ड्स हैं सारे स्टाफ रूम की जगह एस्टेब्लिशमेंट आ गया तो भैया इतनी जरूरत क्या थी स्टाफ रूम कह देते पर वो जो प्रिंसिपल हैं उनका अंग्रेजी के प्रति स्नेह कुछ ज्यादा है और वो एक विक्टोरियन इंग्लिश को इंग्लिश मानती हैं वो कम्युनिकेशन में विश्वास नहीं करती सो शी वॉन्ट्स टू एक्चुअली एम्फिसाइज इट इन मोर कंट्राइव लैंग्वेज वो इंप्रेशन क्रिएट कर रही है वो अपनी अथॉरिटी भी जता रही है शी ट्राइंग टू ब्राउ बीट द स्टाफ मेंबर्स सो शी यूज वेरी हैवी वर्ड एंड शी से you are not expected to consume food in this establishment bhari bhar kam awaaz nahi hai lekin usme convey ho rahi hai the point i'm trying to make is ab teesri cheez badi aasan ho sakti hai jo staff room mein nahi kahi ja sakti lekin canteen mein kahi ja sakti hai jahan aap chalte phirte common language mein convey kar sakte hain oh bhaiya do you know We are not supposed to have a grub in the staff room. अब जो grub word है, वो एक slang है. So उसके साथ आप bloody लगा दीजिए तो वो vulgar slang हो जाएगी. So what I'm trying to say is, language has emotions, language has tones, and in order to emphasize tones. we use different forms of expression and depending on what kind of expression we are using connotative layer changes bhasha to wahi hai baat to badi seedhi se kehni hai kya ko khana ya nahi khana khana canteen mein khaiye lekin kehne ke dhang bahut hai jo translator is rahasya ko samajh jata hai i think he is well on his way to become a successful translator because translation my dear friends is all about exploring multiple choices har jagah aapke samne ek sawal khada ho jayega ab main kis shabd ka chunav karu ya ek hindi word hai iske liye kaun sa aisa shabd chunu punjabi ch kahange sandeep ji kehenge tukwa शब्द केड़ा होएगा या इंग्लिश में कहेंगे व्हाट वुड बी द मोस्ट अप्रोप्रिएट सो ये जो अप्रोप्रिएट वर्ड की सर्च है यही ट्रांसलेशन है एंड बिकॉज दिस सर्च रिमेन्स एंडलेस देर फोर देर आर एंडलेस पॉसिबिलिटीज इन ट्रांसलेशन इसलिए ट्रांसलेशन कभी खत्म नहीं होती है इट नेवर कंक्लूड इट सेल्फ इज एन एंटरप्राइज विच ऑलवेज रिमेन्स ओपन एंडेड नेक्स्ट I think we can move on to the next because otherwise they'll have discomfort. So I've talked about different styles, different domains, I've talked about different frequencies. It depends on whether you're using it as an oral expression or you're writing it down. I think registers would change. all this has to be kept in mind i'm not going to overemphasize this much of what i've said it's a kind of an explanation of what you find on this ppt so i can i think you can merely look at it note it down and then i move on to the next stage please next i think we can move on to the next we'll cut this out now i just want to briefly bring to your notice how you know we talked about equivalence and we talked about meaning 
but we also discovered in the process equivalence should be there but it is not there it is hard to achieve meaning should be conveyed but it is not necessarily conveyed in order to understand what are the kind of slippages we have in terms of equivalence and meaning i think we need to look at very briefly anthony popovics who was also a very important theorist he's talked about five kinds of shifts that occur in translation quickly we go over it first is constitutive shift this is because constitution of each language is different second is yarnaric shift sometimes what we do is i give you a poem to translate you make a prose piece out of it poem becomes a prose piece just because it's written in free verse it doesn't mean you don't really have to keep nuances or music in mind therefore that would be yarnaric shift third is individual shift as i said earlier each one of us uses language in a very distinctive manner we all speak english we all speak kannada but no two speakers speak kannada or marathi or english in the same manner punjabi punjab mein angrezi ek tarah se boli jati hai karnataka mein aur dhang se boli jati hai because of the interference of the mother tongue that is one but linguists also believe there is something called idiolect idiolect ka main ek chhota sa example dunga i was once translating a work i sent it to the editor editor sent it back to me saying that you are overusing a particular word called perhaps jab maine us original ke sath compare kiya then i discovered she had she was saying the right thing i was unnecessarily adding perhaps kyun kyunki mujhe khud ko aadat hai perhaps use karne ki i overdo it kuch shabd hain jo hamare sath jud jate hain जो हम ओवर यूज करते हैं कुछ एक्सप्रेशन हैं जिनको हम ओवर यूज करते हैं ट्रांसलेशन इज अरर इन विच यू कैन सी योर ओन लिंग्विस्टिक ईडियोसिंक्रेसीज आपकी क्या क्या फ्लॉज हैं इन लैंग्वेज यूज आप देख सकते हैं द नेक्स्ट इज नेगेटिव शिफ्ट नेगेटिव शिफ्ट क्या है यू अंडरस्टूड यू हैव रेड अ पैसेज यू हैवेंट अंडरस्टूड इट प्रॉपरली देर इज मिस अंडरस्टैंडिंग misunderstanding will lead to mistranslation topical shift kya hai the work was done in 7 1617 century shakespeare translate kar rahe hain and you do not assign that word let's say koi bhi shakespeare ka word hai usko aap 20th century meaning nahi de rahe hain aap usko 16th century meaning de rahe hain that is dislocating a text because the question that you need to ask yourself is who are you translating it for are you doing it uh i'm sorry there is some confusion somewhere there's a lot of noise that is coming in if we can stop that or filter it out i think it will be good because it's a kind of constant irritation next so topical shift is when we are not quite able to understand that language evolves and it progresses and meanings change when we translate a 16th century text thinking that we have to do it for 16th century audience wo to hai hi nahi aap to 21st century mein baithe hain so aapko aaj ke liye translate karna hai that brings me to the next point the third approach that is communicative approach or communicative definition नाउ ऐसा लगेगा कि कम्युनिकेशन तो ट्रांसलेशन का एंड रिजल्ट है ही हर ट्रांसलेशन शुड बी कम्युनिकेटिव बिकॉज वाई आर वी डूइंग ट्रांसलेशन वी वॉन्ट टू कम्युनिकेट समथिंग अबाउट अ कल्चर अबाउट अ लैंग्वेज अबाउट द वे इन विच पीपल थिंक फील बिहेव Or the way in which they conduct themselves. We want to talk about our traditions, our rituals, 
the entire sociology, cultural sociology is part of anything that we do. So communication is implicit in this, but communication is a complicated process. I hope you understand that because very often what happens is in communication, there are transmission losses. What I say is not necessarily what you understand. What you understand or what I say is very different. And if it's different, there will be communication losses. So translate communication can be transparent or opaque. It can be direct or indirect. And beyond that, I think the most important question that we need to ask ourselves is whether we are doing writer oriented communication. That means I want to read writer's intention, just go up intentional fallacy. And I want to translate that intention in the translated text, or I want to do text oriented communication. Text oriented communication would be I'm faithful to the text. I forget who has written it. I'm only concerned about the language, the manner in which it has been used in the text. Or I do translator oriented communication where I'm focusing on myself. I'm saying, oh, it is my book. I am translating it so I can take any amount of liberty I want to. It's a question of latitude or liberty. But last is reader oriented communication. So these are some of the possibilities that we can think about next. One of the important questions that we need to ask ourselves when we are thinking of communication is why am I communicating? Why do I pick up a particular text? I need to ask myself, why do I translate Gurdyal Singh so extensively? Why not Dilip Kaur Tivana? Why not Amrita Pritam? So, and the second question which is related to it is, for whom? Am I translating it for a fellow Indian sitting in Tamil Nadu? Or am I translating it for someone sitting out there in the West? I'm very clear, my dear friends, I translate for my fellow Indians. I do not translate for someone out there. If someone in the West happens to read my work, so much the better. But otherwise, my purpose is to reach out to a fellow Indian, say someone in Tamil Nadu or say someone in Kerala who doesn't understand Punjabi. I want him to read Gurdyal Singh. Sometimes we can ask ourselves these questions also, which are slightly loaded. Is communication an end in itself or as a means to an end? Am I going to communicate the ideology of the writer as well? Or am I going to do it in a way that I make it ideologically neutral? Then another important question that comes in process of communication is the choices we make. You know, in translation, as I said in the beginning, it's a transaction between SL and TL. But remember, while translating, you will find yourself in a kind of a fix and you'll either bend towards SL or SC or you will bend towards TL or TC, that is target culture. The manner in which you do it or the kind of choices that you make here, I always prefer to bend towards my own culture. That's my way of respecting my culture rather than bend towards English reader or English culture. I would rather be more faithful to my own. That is when I use what I call foreignizing method. This, these are the terms which have been used by Lawrence Vinuti, but that's not very important. Ultimately, I think what is important is that we should be able to understand whether we want to bend towards our own culture or towards 
someone else's culture. That will define my politics, mind you. Next. I would not elaborate much on politics because that's a tricky area one can go on and on. Now, if I have to sum it all up, I would say translation is a human act, not a mechanical one. Now you would understand why I had reservations about actually talking of machine translation. It's a complex, problematic transfer of linguistic, textual, cultural material. Now we can expand this definition from SL to TL. It is, regardless how we choose to look at it, linguistically, philologically, or communicatively, translation is a combination of both creative and critical processes. Both are at work. When you are reading a text, you're translating a text, you're also interpreting the text. When you're making choices in terms of words or the manner in which you would like to phrase a sentence, you're actually making a creative choice. Beyond that, I would also like to say, though it might seem as if our concern is either with equivalence or with meaning or with communication, come to think of it, all three are interconnected. It is equivalence of meaning for purposes of communication. I hope you can relate to it. Next. Next, I would like to emphasize how we need to be aware of the ideological and aesthetic features of a text. Writer ki ideology kya hai? Uski philosophy kya hai? Uska vision kya hai? How far do we align ourselves with this vision? Do we agree with it or do we have to do it with a sense of objectivity? I think the next last slide, yes. Next. Sorry. No, no, sorry. We have to go back. Summing up three. We as translators have to know that even if there is ideological purpose implicit in the original work, whether we want to translate it or not, we have to decide that. We also have to have awareness of the audience for whom we are translating. Equivalence, let me say, is a desirable goal in translation. But it's not always an achievable one. And finally, all kinds of shifts would occur. You have to negotiate your way around them. Don't be intimidated by these shifts. These are like little roadblocks along your journey. And I think there is some pleasure in winning a hurdle race. So in the same manner, there is some joy in translating a work which offers you all the challenges. And I think translation finally makes us aware of similarities and differences. One can go on and on. There are joys of translation. There are pleasures in it. And one can also talk about the pains that one has to go through. That's life for you. It's a mixed bag. And so is translation. So go for it. And when you go in for it, don't think that you need to carry baggage of theory. All this theory that I've talked to you about, I arrived at much later. First, I became a practicing translator. Then I encountered some of the challenges. Then I looked for answers. And then I also looked for sources where I could see how other people had countervailed some of these challenges. It's a journey, and I'm sure you would have your own story to tell when you go on this journey. Thank you so much.